In my years of being a foodie, one thing that I've noticed is that when it comes to locally prominent dishes, there is no king. A few restaurants will stand at the top, leaving the rest of us to pick which of them is our favourite. But when it comes to nasi lemak, based on every comment, every video, every online article that I have come across, all roads lead to the village park. A nasi lemak restaurant that has been around for the past 21 years. A nasi lemak that has spawned imitators both locally and in Singapore. A nasi lemak that has over 10,000 reviews on Google. This is the most popular nasi lemak in the world. Let's get it guys. What time is it now? 2.17 and it's packed. I think it's going to be packed all, time, all times of the day. They can seat about 130, 50 people, I think. But the good thing is there wasn't a queue outside. I am going one. Yeah, rendang chicken one, uh, dangi one. The turnover is crazy. Eh? I'm sitting here for the past like what eight minutes, and the amount of people like leaving and coming in, the amount of plates that are being, you know, cleaned up. It's hard to imagine how many plates they sell a day. Like if you count the the grab orders, I would say like it's an absurd amount. And they open for a relatively long uh, period of time, 6:30 a.m. to 5:30 p.m. I believe. Normally establishments of like this prestige, right? They open for way lesser hours. Almost always there's a midday break. If not, they only function for half a day. Oh, mine is here. Thank you. Okay, here we go. The moment I've been thinking about for one month now. <laughs> I'm actually a bit nervous. Rice is warm. No, rice is not warm. Rice is hot. Oh my God, this is the hottest rice so far. But the chicken is warm. Good enough, I guess. You see? It has squish. Not a lot of it, but medium squish. Still pretty loose. Let's give this a go. One more of truth, boys. Holy. Why? Why? The coconut fragrance of the rice is the best in the series so far. I am puzzled because so far in the series, with a stronger coconut fragrance comes a more fatty flavor, growth of coconut milk. But here, it has so much coconut fragrance. It tastes more coconutty than actually eating coconut. And yet the rice is still so light and like spammable. It helps that the rice is quite generously salted, so as to encourage appetite. But y'all can tell by now how good the rice is based on how much rice is there left on my plate before I even <laughs> think about the sambal. Speaking of sambal, very very jammy. Like this texture is like what you would use in a heavy ham uh, roll or pastries in general. Like the texture kind of re uh, reminds you of like pineapple tarts. So it means that it has been cooked low and slow for a very long period of time for it to be reduced like that. Let's try with the rice. <laughs> this tastes like a ton of shallots, low and slow, constant stirring, minimum one hour. It's like that kind of endgame caramelized onions that are so annoying to make because it requires constant effort for such a long period of time. That's so freaking delicious. We talk about caramelization of sambal in this series. This sambal is the one that portrays it the best. There's this rich, deep sweetness that you cannot get from anything else. You can't sugar your way here. And it's like six out of 10 spicy, so like you can enjoy the sweetness while not like, you know, flinching because of the spiciness. This is freaking delicious, eh? <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Time for the ayam goreng. Let's break it apart first. Visible cut marks, both for marination to penetrate and for the cook to go through. Give this a go. I'm 
so angry. I'm so angry. Why is their chicken quality so much better? I mean, yes, obviously, it's not frozen. But on top of that, they still make cuts inside. The same way Korean fried chicken would to try to flush out the chicken stench. But since they are using fresh chicken with very little of that stench, doing so will completely eliminate it such that even when you gnaw around the deepest parts of the chicken near the bone, it's all but rich golden chicken fat flavor. The rempe marination is also great, not too loud. So far in the series, there has been a tendency for rempeys to be a bit too forward, such that when you bite in, you taste less of chicken and more like, you know, ginger. But rempeys job is supposed to eat the chicken, not stand beside it. In the end, the main point should be eating fried chicken. Okay, let's go on with the two sides. We have a beef rendang, which is really tough. It's actually not that tough. Okay, a little bit tough. It's okay. And then the rendang chicken. Really, really tender. Their chicken is really, really good. All done. Great meal. I need to take these order sheets and make payment. And I'll see you guys soon. Recap. Water rice. Averagely lemak, but so incredibly fragrant with coconut. Is it the quality of the coconut they are using? Is it, is it coconut oil? This is the first time this series where when the rice arrived on the table, I can smell coconut. Definitely helps that it was hot. Again, the first time in this series where I struggled to even um, eat the rice because it was scalding my hand. And then the sambal, so much depth of flavor. It's reduced and concentrated so much. If you have made your own caramelized onions before, like the no rush at all, slow heat all the way, the flavor that you can get at the end is unmatched. It's a simple idea, but executed so, so well. And then the fried chicken, super delicious. Everything did right. I'm kind of curious what will happen if they don't cut it. Yes, you risk a tiny bit of chicken stench being there and the marination not penetrating as much. But what if all the juices was encased properly like a proper piece of fried chicken? I think, right, just that nasi lemak aside, that will be one of the best pieces of fried chicken. And then to their biggest hit, which I have not mentioned yet. You must understand the skill they are doing this at. Usually, in the late game of such prestigious food places, they end up in one of two scenarios. First, they serve 9 out of 10 food to 70 people, arbitrary number. Or, they serve 7 out of 10 food to 700 people. They eventually end up in one of the two. Because the whole operation behind how you make nasi lemak for 70 people per day versus 700 people per day, the recipe is totally different. Now we are not talking about recipe as in a home kitchen, one recipe, one portion kind. But Village Park is breaking that. They are serving 9 out of 10 food to 700 people. 700 people is an arbitrary number. Their numbers is definitely in the thousands. And so far I have not seen any restaurant run that kind of operation. Like shout out to all their staff, the cooks, the service staff, the people cleaning the table, and the cashier. The cashier was going crazy. Like his hands was going crazy when I was checking out. The magic that was expediting the grab orders outside. Their operation as a unit is phenomenal to be able to pull this off. That means right, whether you are a tourist with 3 hours to spare in KL, or whether you live opposite village park right, you can drop in for a good pair of nasi lemak. They will be able to serve you within a very reasonable amount of time and at unreasonable prices. With their fame at their level of demand, they, would, they can increase their price 50% and I don't think it will hurt them a lot. Eldrick, don't give them ideas now. And this is something they probably thought about. I mean, who doesn't think about raising their prices? I gamble that they have even thought about franchising, but neither raising their price nor franchising is something that they want to do now. I definitely see why. Why all roads lead to Village Park. One plate I'll walk for the Nasi Lemak, two plates I'll take a bus for the Nasi Lemak, and three plates I'll go anywhere in Kuala Lumpur for the Nasi Lemak. And Village Park is... 3 plates. Obviously, not just the food, but the whole operation, everything is so impressive. I'm almost more impressed by how the place is run rather than the Nasi Lemak. 
Because I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything like this. Imagine if Funji served their turkey min at like 700 people at a go. Or Sui Guan Hokkien Mi or Haiki Teochew Cha Kui Teo. Serve 1000 people, no longer have to queue one hour anymore. I'm pretty confident that they are the best for a restaurant of this scale. But if we were to boil it down to just the plate of nasi lemak in front of me, I'm not so sure yet. But that concludes our Malaysia arc. We have had some incredible nasi lemaks here. And even though we are just past the halfway mark of the series, I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if the eventual best nasi lemak was from this arc. But we are not heading back to Singapore just yet. There is a dish in Indonesia called nasi uduk. Which, if you put the dish name away for a moment, and just look at the recipe, they are effectively the same as nasi lemak. But Eldre, why do you want to include nasi uduk when it's already blatantly a different name? One, I can't go home knowing that there might be a better version of the dish here in Indonesia. And two, I need to break into a bigger audience, my friends. Jesus, I'm struggling out here. So, I'm now here at the top of the Mo National Monument in Jakarta. And we'll be spending the next few days searching for the best nasi uduk here. It was a journey just to reach here. I had to pass by a demonstration where people were setting things on fire outside a police station. I had to solve the maze of National Monument where the entrance is away from the actual thing. And then you have to go underground through these like game-like tunnels and then down a staircase and then take the quest from the NPC. But I'm here now. And after we rest, we will start the Indonesia arc. But for now, that's all I have for you guys this time. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.